And here we are again. Just last, last week, I will be presenting you to two fantastic people. And this time you can already see them together with me on the screen. Today we are going to have um, a meeting, an interview with two persons who have had a very specific and important role in the life of Brian McLaren. Or should I say it maybe was the other way around. Brian McLaren had a very <laughs> uh, important part in their life. So today I'm first going to tell you who we will be talking to. Probably you will recognize Rob, with whom I had the interview last week. So Rob McLaren is a happily married man and father of two beautiful young girls. He is a passionate horseman. He lives in South East Queensland, and he's also the son of Dr. Brian McLaren. He was the former CEO of Advanced Photonic Therapy, and he is now a published author. Welcome, Rob. Thank you and very much, Eva. Yeah, thank you. And on the other hand, we also have Trevor Woosencroft today. Now, Trevor is a happily married man of plus five, 55 years. Oh my God, I'm not even 55 years old. I can't imagine to be uh, together with somebody else for so long. It's fantastic. Um, Trevor is also the dad of a teacher in Victoria and of a doctor in Western Australia. He himself is a passionate horse and cattleman and lives in Queensland. He told me also that he has been in the cattle and horse industry all his life. And still today at 77, he is passionate about photonic therapy and is sharing this information into the world. Trevor, also to you, welcome to this meeting. Thank and, you, Eva. And I'm gonna start with you because we already know some things from Rob from last time that we had the meeting. So my first question to you, Trevor, is going to be, when and how did you come to meet Dr. Brian McLaren? Well, it was very interesting, Eva. Uh, uh, the company that I was working with uh, in Victoria, we, we, had, uh, prob we had the biggest stud in uh, uh, cattle stud limousine in Victoria. And we also had a uh, stud in uh, uh, both in Canada and in uh, England and, uh, and Ireland. And uh, the fellow that owned their company moved, uh, he was a uh, lawyer. So he, he moved back to Queensland uh, with his children. And uh, then we sold the property where we were and we came up to, to Queensland and uh, we had two properties up here. And uh, I was went one day to uh, one Sunday to have a cup of tea and a chat to the neighbors and uh, just, you know, to try and see what was the lay of the land. And the first thing, of course, I always say, and it doesn't matter whether you've got horses, dogs, cats, or whatever, you always need to know where the local vet is because you never know when you want an emergency. And when I went to, uh, to see these people, it's, uh, uh, I said, one, one of the very first things I said was, uh, what I've got to get is a, a good vet. Mm -hmm. And this chap looked at me and he says, well, there's one in the local town, which is Allera. He says, you wouldn't want to use him. And I said, why not? And he says, well, he said he's got a red laser light thing that he's used to treat horses with. And, uh, and this, was, this is when he was developing it. And he said, you want to keep away from him? And I just said straight away, he's the person I need to know because I need somebody that thinks outside the square. And that was my first the first knowledge of Brian. I, I you know, naturally hadn't met him then. I'd only been there for a week or so. So it was about three weeks before we actually, uh, uh, we had Brian out to the farm and, and he used to come out to, uh, uh, you know, because we always had, there's always veterinary work you need with uh, when you've got stoked cattle like this because uh, we actually, uh, when we came back to Queensland, we brought up a, uh, a nitrogen tank full of embryos. So we were starting to stud all over again. And uh, and a lot of these cattle, cattle were yeah, worth a fair bit of money. So Brian was out there uh, at, at quite a few times uh, in the very early days. And you, know, you may have, uh, my horse seemed to be pretty prone to colic, but we didn't need to fix it in those days. But now, of course, we, we know know what you've got to do. So uh, he was uh, he was got to that stage where uh, him and I got on very well. And, and the vets of today and I don't get on very well, simply because of we're in a different era. 
and 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 we do have a lot of knowledge. I've been working since I was 13 years old, so I've worked with 60 odd vets is by now. And and the thing is, Brian was you know he's, he's only about 12 months younger than me, so we we sort of hit it off pretty well, yeah, you know, like straight away. And uh, so it was that in that time that I got to know him very well. And and the first torches were actually made about 10 minutes away from where I lived. So we'd, we'd had a lot of interaction at that time, exactly what was going on. So uh, he's, I, I would just, I just can, can consider I'm very fortunate to know him in the very early days before Photonic therapy was even out there when he was only, you know, working on it. But of course, being because he was there and was doing things, we always got around to talking about the photonic therapy. And and and, and honestly, I never had a, had a clue what on earth it was. But I, I'm always looking for something that's that's going to improve. We don't want to be just staying resting on their laurels whatsoever. So it it was it was very interesting time for me and my time of life uh, to be able to do those sorts of things okay and what can you tell us from the time that brian so you got to know him when he was still a vet but yes. then you also got to know him when he was tra uh, transitioning from being a tradition no it's not a traditional vet he was never a traditional <laughs> vet but i mean from being a vet to a people's yeah. therapist what what can you well, tell us about that time well actually there was because he had so many people coming to uh, or wanting to, I mean, if the medical practitioners couldn't fix it, you got sent to the vet down the road. So he was, he was fixing all sorts of things. Yeah. Like, and, and it just happened to be that there was only, uh, he only had two clients left. There was ourselves at our farm and also one chap that had a dairy, uh, which was, you know, only about five, 10 miles away. And an interesting thing at that dairy, at that fellow at the dairy, he was there, there one day and he was playing around with his, his shoulder, was giving the problems, and Brian was there treating the cow. He said, what's wrong with you? And he said, oh, oh this shoulder, he says, been killing me for years. So Brian said, well, we better try and fix it. So he, anyway, he fixed it, and, uh, and he says, well, how busy are you? He says, well, not too bad today. Why? He says, well, uh, my young fella up there, he says, oh, come and have a cup of tea. He says, the young fella at home, he said, he's, he's been wet in the bed for so long, it's not funny. So Brian said, hmm, righto. So he goes up to and treats the young fella. Lo and behold, they didn't, he, he never wet the bed again from that day, that day on. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, when he, uh, when he came out to, to us one time that uh, I said to him, I rang him on a Saturday night and I had four bulls going to market on Monday and they have to have a vet certificate. So I very sheepishly rang Brian on Saturday night and said, oh, do you think there's any chance of you coming out tomorrow to, to give us a stip for the, a cert for these bulls? And he says, oh, it's a typical farmer. And yeah. anyway, he says, well, is there anything else you want? And I said, well, yeah, really, I could do with the Sunday papers because I won't get them. So then I called out to my wife, I had to call out to Laura and says, oh, is there anything? Yeah. She says, oh, well, we needed some bread and milk. So there we had the vet came out to look at, you know, four bulls. And uh, he brings the paper and the milk and the bread. And then I'm walking around gingerly on one foot because my ankle was crooked. So I'd sprained my ankle. I was trying to jump a gate. And anyway, he said, oh, guys, he says, you blokes. So anyway, he's, he sat me down on the stump. So I sat down the stump and he treated that ankle, give me all my, all my things, that the, the, the uh, groceries that he brought out. And then he says, now, what did you get call me for? So <laughs> that's when we <laughs> That's when we finished up. That we did actually treat, uh, look at those four bulls. So it it it's quite funny. Yeah, you know, look, I've got there's lots of those things that actually happened. Yeah, you know, over the time that you would, it's a bit like uh, uh, the fellow that was on the Yorkshire vet in in England, Dr. Harriet. You know, like that was those sort of things do actually happen. But yeah. of course, if it ha if I didn't know Brian like I knew him, I, I wouldn't even think about doing that sort of situation because we do have not in that particular town but just about the same distance away we have another big town which has got at least i think 10 vets up there and uh, but because we're in a very very big horse area thoroughbreds and that so uh, th there's plenty of them around but uh, and of course like everything else uh, he he copped a lot of flack because of this red light yeah. but it's like everything yeah it doesn't matter what happens there's always a bit of 
or you know, to a jealousy, call it what you like, or they just won't look at something. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, that's how I get myself into trouble. I look at too many things. So he, he then he uh, went, because I used to have to go back to him, yeah, reasonably regularly, because I had, you know, like uh, shoulder problems and knee problems, which I, if I never had the light and I hadn't started off with Ryan, I wouldn't be walking today. I can guarantee that. And uh, anyway, I was in there one day and uh, in the backyard there was a big ostrich. And I said to him, oh, don't tell me, you're breeding ostriches too now, are you? Oh, he says, don't talk about it. And I says, well, he says, somebody brought this ostrich down. He says, it's having trouble standing up and I got to fix it. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, it was it was so funny because, you, you know, see, you're in town, mind you, and in his yard, he's going to be ostrich. But uh, also one day when I was there, which was, it's, it's a bit of a shame, but there was a, there was a lady there waiting and she came in just after me and she was got cancer all over her, yeah, you know, skin cancer mm-hmm. in a big mess. And, and I said to Brian, what on earth could you do for that lady? And he says, she's, she's at the situation where she, she, she'll try anything to see if she can do some good. I don't know just how it went, but he said, even if I can just make things a bit easier for her, he says, it'll be a plus anyway. So this is what, how it had got to the stage where he was getting people that just could not do things, you know, like they, uh, they got, they got the end of the tether, nowhere to go. And, and it's surprising. I had one last, a fellow rang me up last night. Somebody told him about us and uh, uh, they've got uh, emphysema or something and they're in only 65 and in terrible trouble. And they rang to uh, see what, you know, whether a, a, a torture worked for them and all the rest of it. So there's a lot, a lot of people out there we could help if we could get to them. Yeah. And, uh, but then the other, the other big one, which I'll never, there was quite a few others, but one I'll never forget. This young lady brought a baby in one day and she, uh, uh, the baby, had, uh, it, it couldn't pass its motions properly. So it's in terrible pain all the time. And it was booked in to have a, a, a uh, operation, I think Col- about. Colostomy. Colostomy. Yes, put, have a colostomy bag on. Now, I mean, so that's frightening even to think about that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, they came to Brian and said, what can you do? And he says, well, it's all up to the body. I can get it started. So anyway, he treated this child and they went home. About half an hour later, the phone went and he picked it up and he was knew it was there because he thought, hell, what's wrong? Mm-hmm. And he, she says, Dr. McLaren. He said, yes. And she said, the baby is pooing like a wood duck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean to say, it's that's incredible. Those things that can, that can happen in this situation, and uh, uh, you know, like that child went on, you know, with no problems. All it was getting everything working again, and and you know, a, the young child also had to pull the pot of water under it uh, at some weeks before, and she was scolded to Billy out, and everything she's in a mess. Brian treated her kept her going and two years later or two and a half years later you'd hardly even know she got a mark on her so yeah. there's so many things that can be done and it's it's just unfortunate that um, he's not there with us today to be able to do lots of things we could like I, I had a lady ring up one day and said look what do you know about Rasmussen's disease mm-hmm. and I thought what Rasmussen's disease so uh, look I said look uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can do so. But I said, but look, just give us a bit of time and let me I refresh my memory. I didn't have a ruddy clue what she was talking about. So I rang my daughter up in Western Australia. Now, she is a very, very high qualified uh, uh, women's vet, mainly, and, uh, uh, and children. And uh, she says, well, Trev, I know you don't drink. She calls me Trev because I don't want to be called dad. It makes me feel too old. So yeah. she calls me Trev and she says, uh, I don't think i know you don't drink but i think you've been drinking this time i said but lou haven't you heard this is no i rang brian up as soon as i put the phone down and then he goes on and tells me about all these things that he saw in america with Rasmus disease yeah. and this was the unfortunate problem with Brian mclaren he was a bit of a bit of a nuisance at times because <laughs> you ring him up and you'd finish up on the half an hour three calls there and then you got off the phone and you think hell now what did he say about that <laughs> so you got to start all over again but it, it was interesting that he was able to do all those things with us yeah but it's so he he he's uh, his what's name his transition from you know like uh from from being a vet 
uh, which was a, just a general vet around uh, in, into helping so many people. And uh, th th there's there's a heap of stories out there, but which they're able to they're able to he's able to do so much for for people. It's just incredible, really. I th I believe anyway. Yeah. Certainly made a big difference to my life. Yeah, yeah, because uh, because all of this in the end, well, not in the end, at a certain moment, uh, you then decided to start yourself with photonic therapy, and you became one of Brian's uh, certified uh, photonic therapy practitioners. So when when did you start? In uh, I think it was a rough be roughly about two thousand and four, or no, 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 been before that. It, I was trying to think there before we come on air because I meant to check it up, but I forgot. But because Brian was still in America at the time, because you know Rob's sister was had the business in Victoria then, and I was uh, we'd actually uh, sold the farm, left the farm, and my wife and I we were on the road. We were a bit like Darby and Joan with a forty foot truck and trailer going through all eastern Australia uh, with cat field days, cattle equipment, but um, we'd. Uh, because we know so many people in, in Eastern Australia that we could just stay, so we met them. But And it just happened, and I can't remember exactly how it happened, but uh, I'd, uh, I went to see uh, Brian's uh, daughter, or Rob's sister, uh, down at, because we was down at Seymour. And, uh, and I'd rang, oh, that's right, I'd rang Brian two or three times on the phone, that's right, and, and that's, it, it was suggested by the people that make the torches, well, look, you know, like, uh, you know, if you're going around. So this is how we started off, actually. We would, all the field days, we'd have photonic therapy. Don't know where we went. We were always selling it there and then. And uh, so uh, there was at least, I think, two years before, or might be more before Brian come home, that only uh, that before I'd even sort of saw him again, that we could work a lot of things out. And that uh, video you're talking about with Rob, with Rob and that there, well, uh, I mean to say, I spent hours and hours on that, going backwards and forwards, and mm. and, and all the rest of the stuff, the videos that we had there, um, because I needed to get a lot more in that head. Then I'd have to ring Brian up in America and ask him about something. But fortunately, he didn't keep me on for half an hour at the time. So, uh, but so we've been involved in it all that time. And when when Brian came back home to Australia, uh, we that's when we run. I suppose we would have run ten or a dozen workshops, and uh, he uh, and when he was, I think it was the Victoria Point. I think Rob wasn't it Victoria Point. He went down to. He come back to, uh, and yes. I'd go down and see him down there. So that's only, yeah, you know, like yeah. about two hours away from me. But so I, I was very fortunate that that area, that area really, and a lot of stuff that uh, that we've got, and yeah, you wouldn't because you had that sort of closeness relationship, majority of people, uh, you, because you say things off the cuff, you don't even think about it. And you, it's hard to sit down and, and, and gather all of the stuff. But unfortunately, uh, I did not, I definitely did not make as much use of it as I, as I could have done, really, because the more and more I get into it, because I also have done an equine acupuncture course and uh, to, just to try and get my head around lots of these things, and uh, uh, you, you only have to ask him one thing or, or start a conversation off and he could bring that all together, which uh, for me is a, in my situation isn't easy to do because he was an incredible. If, if you read his bio, it's incredible the things that he's done, what, how he's been able to reach so many things. Yeah. But it's, uh, but anyway, well, I think that's. Yeah, I'll get back to you later yep. on. But I'm going to give uh, Rob now some time to tell us uh, some information because Rob, you as the son, you who were helping your dad with, with this at that time, still McLaren Photonic Therapy. Um, how was Brian going to tell the world about, about this therapy? Because he had uh, access to the healing modality, which was not invasive, which was scientifically uh, explainable, which he did in his, for his master's degree. Uh, it can heal uh, chronic injuries. There is no placebo effect. So how was Brian going to tell the whole world of what he had developed? Can you tell us more about that? I can, Ava. I, I can. Um, yes, it, it, indeed, it was a uh, quite a challenge. Um, how do you tell the world? And also in the face of, as Trevor alluded to, entrenched 
agendas by both the medical professionals and the veterinary professionals. Uh, this is in um, the mid 90s. So uh, only 20 years after the West has re-engaged with China and, and information starts to come out about acupuncture. And so, you know, in any professional's life, 20 years is, is um, not a long time. So this was exceptionally confronting, um, confronting information that traditional Chinese medicine uh, or the stimulus of the skin could, could do anything. Um, and especially um, leaping across to the stimulus of the skin by light. So, um, so very much uphill uh, battle uh, he faced, as well as the, um, you can well imagine the concerns and of, the, of drug companies. Mm. Um, to, to think that, uh, that you could buy a light that would, would deal with all the, the concerns, the normal everyday concerns from cuts hemorrhaging, headaches, menstrual concerns, aches and pains, let alone the more obscure activities and, and, uh, and ailments that, uh, that Trevor alluded to. So drug companies would most certainly not want this sort of information out there. So, so here's Brian's challenge. And um, he came from a background of being a sole private practitioner as veterinarians do. So he's sort of, um, he's the, the chairman of the board and he's the, uh, the, the janitor by night I, I, as each of these sole uh, young you know, country business people are. So his business uh, knowledge was, um, was, was, was limited to that place. Um, so in 1996, his solution uh, was to franchise to look at franchising uh, local therapists um, within that McLaren photonic therapy framework. And although the healing was outstanding, despite Brian's best efforts, the business model that he was creating was not sound, which was an unfortunate step. So a, a learning process uh, for him and, and for us all. Um, I was his first therapist and I opened his uh, first uh, McLaren Photonic Therapy franchise uh, therapy outlet in the, the city of the Gold Coast mm -hmm. um, in, in southeast Queensland, just south of Brisbane. And Brian quickly established 10 franchisees uh, in Australia um, in about 1998. Um, but then just as we all began to get going, uh, in 1999, he, was, uh, he departed to the United States and the, the franchise system that, that we had stood up fell over, it, it collapsed. So, um, so just, and that was then the shame, I suppose, that as Trevor has, has alluded to, and we all know, um, so much good could be done, but, it, but how can, you know, little people without money sort of uh, try their very best, but um, uh, it, just, it just didn't work out at that time, yeah. So that was his first step into tell the world. Yeah. And was that also at that time when you and Brian made that famous 50 minute video? It, it was, it was in, in 1997 uh, again. So um, Brian's approach, approaching, he's in his late fifties, he's uh, nearly 60, obviously. Um, he made that, that video. So the imagery that you see of him at that time, um, Oh, yes, here we are, um, <laughs> colouring in the horses. Um, we, Brian had access to a, uh, a local racing stables, which always con contains a, a plethora of sore horses. And it was here that we were able to gain that essential imagery of severe reactions. Oh, there's my little brother <laughs> <laughs> from 20 years ago. Yeah. So, um, so yes, it's many times we can uh, manipulate. And here we go. Here's an imagery of a very sore horse. And this is what most people don't get to see. Ooh. Oh. Yes. And so, yes, the horse wants to kick there and is, is very, very concerned. And, of course, there's the ethics. Should 
we be live with that horse. Um, we don't all want to walk up and poke that very sore horse so that we all can understand what that um, that reaction is. So um, so by just taking those one those series of images, they've sort of been a, a wonderful legacy and a support um, to, to many people. So it was a, it was a wonderful project to be a part of. And I know that in next week's interview, we will be talking about everything that happened in the United States when Brian went overseas. Um, but what was the transition? What was the move? What was the key? Why did he go to the States in the first place? Can you tell us something about that already? Yes, yes, I can. In 1998, at the time that our franchises were, were coming together, 1996, 97, 98, um, in 98, Brian attended a pain conference in, in Arizona, and he was fascinated to see um, at that time there was um, discussion on how do you describe pain? How do you, you know, is your pain out of 10? How much is your pain? Is it on a, a linear scale or a logarithmic scale? Um, so he was fascinated to go and listen to, with all of this, his knowledge that, that he's just acquired, um, listen to um, the professionals, both especially medical professionals, because his patients, as I think we said, will only say moo. So it's very difficult for him to gauge um, their sense of pain. So off he went to Arizona and it was there that he was invited by some uh, doctors um, some American doctors to come to the United States in early 1999. And so with that invitation um, and, and, and all of that support, that was sort of, it appeared as if a door had opened finally. And so uh, that will be then the, the lead into his international first steps. Yeah. Okay. Well, we will be talking about the international steps in the next episode, because then we will also have some international other from other countries than Australia join us from the UK and from the United States. And so we will be talking next week in the interview about the international steps. But before we go, Rob and Trevor, how about, because people just love to hear stories, how about telling us each of you one more, one or two more stories about what you always remembered about Brian, what has really struck you and what's really, you know, what people should be knowing. So please share more stories with us. Well, Trevor, well, I'll, I'll let you, well, you, you, you go first. No worries. Well, uh, in 1985, Brian brought to Australia the first uh, live cattle. Well, it was not just cattle. It was all, 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 ca all uh, species. You know, seven four seven, and uh, at that time, it, that's what they do all the time now. But that time, it was illegal. There's Brian. He he'd worked it out and got it all worked out, and he actually <laughs> worked out how to fly from uh, was it east to west? Uh, no, west to east. Sorry. And it saved fuel, and it only had to have three, uh, what's them, three uh, stops on the way over. And uh, it was an interesting because I didn't know about this, and I, because I was doing uh, advisory work uh, in Stow Cattle, I was in Victoria. I went flown back to Victoria uh, uh, one uh, uh, week, and the fellow was there that I used to know back in the seventies when I first went to Victoria. I knew him very well. He used to be tied up with the uh, with embryo work and which I was very highly involved in and also AI and the rest of it. And I knew he'd gone to be a stock inspector. Anyway, I looked at the, you know, I was doing a lot of pre tests and all these sorts of things. And I was looking at the bull and the fellow was supposed to be <laughs> shutting the crash on him. Didn't hold it tight enough. And the bull came back and smashed my hand in the steel. And it was a very cold down there at the time. So I couldn't uh, curse because I had no breath left. Anyway, this young fellow was work with the, well, he wasn't that young, but he was he was working the stud cattle and and he heard all the commotion and anyway uh, he said, oh, what's going on? And I said, oh, just been bugging my hand up because my oh, my thumb's all bent still now. And anyway, uh, it was knocked around pretty well, so I washed it. Then I took the 
torch out of my pocket, didn't I? And put it on. He said, what on earth's that? And I said, what do you mean, what on earth's that? I said, it's a photonic therapy torch. He says, but what do you mean, a photonic therapy torch? He says, it's, it's, it's a bit like uh, pointing the bone, he said. Anyway, I said, oh, no. I said, uh, their vet, uh, Dr. Brian McLaren, he uh, uh, invented this. And I said, a vet? He says, you don't mean Macca, do you? <laughs> and I says, why do you know him? He says, well, him and I brought the first, he says, I was in the bottom deck of the 747 with the, with the cattle or the small animals or stuff, or small animals on top of thing, and Brian was in the top. And uh, and I can tell you what, there were, there's lots of stories out there, but it was just in, incredible to think that, yeah, I come from here and I'd gone down there and I hadn't seen this bloke since the 70s. And this is, uh, well, this would have been in the early 90s when we were going on about this. And uh, it was, it was, you know, like it's, I always worry now that my creditors might find me the same way. But anyway, I just keep moving. I just keep moving. But it, it's interesting that, yeah, like, and, and the, yeah, like the stories you told me about, you can imagine what, because nobody ever done this before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, and because Brian had built Coca, rebuilt Cocos Island, uh, and he was the officer in charge and done all these sorts of things. But uh, but when they got back to the Cocos Island, all everybody was worried about of uh, uh, what beer they got from because they couldn't get any decent beer there. But I think Brian Brian and this fellow made they, I think they made a mess of it before they got back to Cocos Island. But anyway, who knows? Great yeah. story, Trevor. Great story. Yeah. And probably not many people know about this. So, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, no, <laughs> no. I, I just appreciate that you've given us the opportunity to talk about it because the fact of the matter is that he's he changed it's changed my life too. Like I've changed many other people and other horses. You, you know, as I say many times now, uh, if if I don't ever sell another torch or don't treat another horse. I know I've done something that nobody else has done. Yeah. And, uh, and because I know, I know I'm 77, but the fact of the matter is you can do so much if you want to get off your backside and, and with the internet and what's going on, but you've got to be prepared to, like Brian was, prepared to, to look outside the square. Yeah. And yes. that's, that's what fixes things. They yeah. don't get anything fixed if you forget about that. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, and thank you. It's great that you are here to tell us all these stories too. So. <laughs> and in the end, it will also be for people to be able to go back and, and, and revisit these lives. And so also for Rob's children and also for your children and grandchildren, yeah. be able to come back to this and see it again and remember those stories. Well, it, it's incredible. My, although my daughter, you know, she, I think in her practice, she's got over about six doctors, but she, she doesn't use a torch in, in the actual practice. But but she's got one, and uh, and I think uh, all of her extended family over there, they've all got their own torch. And when I'm there, I've always got to give treatments. So uh, it's but it's like it's like everything else that uh, uh, you say to her. You, you she, she ring up and you say about something. She's about, about something so something's happened. And and I remember she kept on a bit. She just hasn't been able to get this throat cleaned up because she does a, a lot of traveling and and a lot of presentations and that. And I says, if you use the torch, oh, and he thought about it. She's only had it about 10 years, mind you. And she used the torch. She got all of the drug cupboard, but it was the torch that fixed it. Yeah. So, that's, so it, it's so good. And there's so many people that have got so much relief because of it. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you very much, Eva, for letting us be on. Um, I'm happy for you to be here. Rob, tell us a story. <laughs> well, there's a... Uh... Well, uh, I, have got, I, had, I had two stories that popped to mind, but I will add a third one. Um, my little girls have been using the torch since they were tiny babies, uh, falling over, scratching themselves, falling off their bicycles. Uh, and when they were very little, not knowing the difference between a, a red torch, and of course we live in the country, and to go out in, in Australia on a farm in the dark, there's, you know, snakes and all these sorts of things that we have over here. So our little girls, then there's always a, a flashlight at the uh, the back door. So the little girls will pick up the flashlight when they were tiny little girls and put the uh, the flashlight on themselves because they had a sore knee. Or Dolly, <laughs> Dolly or Teddy had a sore knee. So, but now, um, but there's a generation now beginning without hesitation, picking up a torch, um, 
a, a sore knee from netball, a scratch or um, a mosquito bite. And so here's a generation of a six-year-old and a nine-year-old, as uh, Trevor just described, without hesitation, it always provides relief. Uh, they put themselves to sleep by that uh, placing the torch in their ear. So it, 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 uh, it, it's wonderful to see Brian's legacy in that. Um, as to my two stories, two quick stories, if I can, and we've got a, our interview this evening is around his transition from being a veterinarian to the wider world. The first uh, quick story, which he would never have seen, that Brian would never have seen as a veterinarian, was as he was beginning to assist uh, people uh, and ladies, and and um, and you may have seen his videos where he asks people to move around on the swivel chair and and he raises uh, people's shirts to get access to their to their spines and and, and things like that. Um, there was one particular lady who kept improving her underwear. So <laughs> she had very, very nice underwear. In fact, it was a G-string, and this was quite confronting to my father, and he thinks this lady is uh, wearing nicer and nicer underclothing. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure he, you know, he got a laugh out of my mother when, he, of course, he would have confessed immediately the lady departed. Um, so that was something that as a veterinarian he'd not, he'd not encountered before. Um, the second, um, the second quick story about transition, he felt as a, a veterinarian coming out of the 1950s and 1960s, that as a, the, the etiquette, the professional etiquette that, that at that time was to, uh, as they said, put your name on a brass plaque and put it outside your door and then wait. So marketing or, or informing or adv advertising into the community was, was, was very much frowned against in that 1950s, 1960s approach that he grew up as a young man. And so he found marketing and advertising in the late 90s, early to, uh, 2000s, uh, very confronting. Um, and his first idea for, for naming his business was applied neurophysiology. <laughs> and we all said, you cannot name a business applied neurophysiology. Oh, no, that's fine. Everybody understands neuro means nerves and physiology means how it works. And we're applying, you know, no, dad, zaps are us. You know, <laughs> I can't call it zaps are us. Applied neurophysiology. So his... his um, his professional decorum took a little bit to adjust yeah. to, uh, to uh, Zaps R Us or, or advanced photonic therapy that we have now. So that they were just two quick descriptions of a, despite his thinking outside the dots, some of the elements that he retained as, oh, that can't be changed, you know, sort of uh, wearing a tie and all those sorts of things. So there we are. And again, Ava, thank you very much for putting this series together. It's it's been a wonderful to work with Trevor again, and it's wonderful to uh, to uh, remember the legacy of this of this person and and how he has influenced for the for very much the better so many lives, people and animals. Yeah, most of most people know him, of course, because of the equine photonic therapy and all the work he did with the equines. But I think that the more people are going to see this, the more people are going to be surprised of uh, everything else that Dr. Brian McLaren has done in his life. So yes. it's great to have you. Well, that will be it then for our session of today here live on the Facebook page of Photonic Therapy. Rob McLaren can be contacted if you want to on his Facebook page. He has his own Facebook uh, profile and Trevor, of course, has his own Facebook profile, but he also has a website. If I remember well, that's wozencroft.com. Is that correct? No, Wozen Photonic Therapy. Oh, sorry. Wozenphotonictherapy.com. Yep. Okay. So if you want to contact any of them, feel free. They they are the past, they are the future, they are they are everything that has to do with photonic therapy. And beyond, of course, because Rob, since he stopped with advanced photonic therapy, he became an author doing Indeed. what his yes. 
doing what his heart loves. And he's already published two books now. So yes. we'll talk about your books in the next interview too, if that's okay for you. That's yeah. okay. Okay, we'll do that. It's always good to have some publicity, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> okay. I am going to stop the live stream and I will see everybody again next week, more or less same time, but I'm sure we'll uh, make a publication in the photonic uh, therapy page because as we are going to have people from the US and from the UK, I will have to find another hour that suits everybody. That's it for today. Okay. Bye for now. Thanks, Eva. Thanks, Rob.